Section 1 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Ed Humple Poetry of St. John of the Cross by St. John of the Cross Translated by David Lewis Section 1 the dark night. I departed in the darkness with the pains of love oppressed. Happy lot, for none observed me. All my house was then at rest. By the ladder that is secret, in the darkness on I pressed. Through the night disguised in safety, all my house was then at rest. Unobserved and unobserving, in the silent blissful night, and in my heart the fire burning was my only guide and light, to the place where he was waiting, safely guided on the way. On I went, the light was brighter than the sunshine of midday. Night that led to my beloved, guide and light upon the way, and made us one, night more lovely than the dawn of coming day. On my breast with flowers covered, which for him alone I kept, I caressed him, and the cedars, waving, fanned him while he slept. When his tresses were disordered by the motion of the air, then I fainted, and he struck me with his hand so soft and fair. Self-forgetting, there I rested, on my love reclined my head, all anxieties discarded, Mid the lilies round me spread. End of section one. Section two of Poetry of St. John of the Cross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two Song of the Soul and its Bridegroom. O oh, my love, where art thou hiding? Why hast thou forsaken me? Thou hast left me to my sorrow, to bewail my loss of thee. Thou hast wounded me, and swiftly as the heart hast fled away, I pursued thee, crying loudly, Thou wert gone, and wouldst not stay. O oh, ye shepherds, I entreat you, as you wend your watchful way to the hill amid the sheepcots every night and every day tell my love if you shall see him of the state in which i lie of my longing and in longing that i languish pine and die in my quest of him no mountains nor wide plains shall me delay i will never stoop to gather even a flower on the way I will cross the frontiers boldly, nor shall giants hold me back, and if savage beasts surround me, I shall dread not their attack. O ye trees of trackless forest, and ye thickets of the land, shade and shelter for the weary, planted by his loving hand. O ye meadows fresh and verdant, pictures of the land above, decked with flowers bright and fragrant, tell me, have you seen my love? The creatures answer. We have seen him, we have seen him, oh, the beauty of his face, moving through the groves and pouring down the treasures of his grace. Hastening on, he looked upon them, oh, that look, how full of love, and the groves became more lovely with a beauty from above. The Bride I am wounded, who can heal me, sorrow-laden, lone, and sad, longing for thy wanted presence that alone can make me glad. Come thyself, and do not tarry, send no messengers to me, they are powerless to tell me aught that I would know of thee. All who serve thee, men and angels, each in his determined place, speak to me with voice unceasing of thy comeliness and grace. They but make my wound still greater. There is that beyond my reach, 
and leaves me sad, what I know not, for they stammer in their speech. O oh, my life, how thou persistest in continuing the strife, for by living on thou livest where is not thy real life. All thou knowest of thy lover are as arrows in thy heart, sent to slay thee. Then how is it thou abidest as thou art? My beloved, thou hast planted in my heart the darts of love. Why dost thou refuse to heal it with the unction from above? Now that thou hast robbed me of it, I in desolation left, why hast thou not taken it with thee, and thus perfected the theft? Tribulations overwhelm me, by anxieties oppressed. Thou alone canst free me from them, therefore give me peace and rest. Let mine eyes then look upon thee, for it is by thee they see. They are thine, and thou hast made them. I will keep them all for thee. O oh, that thou the clouds wouldst scatter, that between us darkly lie. Show thy face, and in the beauty of the vision let me die. For the beatific vision that makes glad the saints above is the only perfect healing of the malady of love. Crystal spring of limpid waters, unexhausted in its flow, O oh, that on thy silvered surface, as a mirror, thou wouldst show unto me those eyes so lovely, and which I so long to see, for their image is already outlined on my heart from thee. My beloved, look not at me with those eyes so full of love. I am flying, overpowered. THE BRIDEGROOM O oh, return to me, my dove! On the hill the heart is looming, and the arrow to it clings, in the air refreshed that stirreth by the motion of thy wings. THE BRIDE My beloved is the mountains, they reveal him unto me, and the lonely wooded valleys with the islands of the sea strange and lovely, and the murmur of the waters as they flow, and the sweet entrancing whisper of the winds that softly blow. My beloved is the silent, tranquil night before the morn, ere the ruddy dawn approaches and another day is born. He is music that is soundless, in the wilderness a voice, and the supper that refresheth, making hearts that love rejoice. Who will catch for us the foxes, that so cunningly repair to the vineyard thou hast planted, now so fruitful and so fair. While we move among the flowers and our hands with roses fill, for the making of a garland, let none appear on the hill. Chilling north wind, from thy caverns send no more the blasts that kill. Come thou, south wind, love enkindling, and the air with odors fill. There among the fragrant flowers my beloved will abide, and will feed among the lilies in the garden of his bride. Now the rose trees and the flowers bloom and blossom in their beds, and around the fragrant amber its delicious perfume sheds. Nymphs of Judah, come not nigh us in the suburbs still remain, that ye may not touch the threshold of our house, your feet restrain. Hide thyself then, my beloved, and let none thy presence trace. Keep for me alone the secret, to the mountains turn thy face. But with loving eyes regarding, look on those who wait on me, on my way among the islands of a strange and stormy sea. THE BRIDEGROOM Cruel lions of the forest, crouching in their secret lair, Fawns and does so wild and restless in all the birds of the air, Nightly terrors that alarm us, gloomy valleys, lowly plain, Burning heat and lofty mountains, howling winds and driving rain. By the music of the viols, by the siren's soothing strain, I adjure you and command you from your fury to refrain. Cease your clamors, come not nigh us, at a distance still abide, And occasion no disturbance of the slumbers. Of the bride. Now the garden sheds its perfume, for the winter's cold is past, 
and the bride in all her beauty has come into it at last. There content among the lilies, in the everlasting arms, she is tranquilly reposing, henceforth free from all alarms. When I saw thee wan and weary, underneath the apple tree, I held out my hand in pity, and betrothed me unto thee. When thy mother deluded fell, in the snare the traitor laid, there the price of thy redemption in my bitter death was paid. The Bride Dens of lions are the fences that protect the bridal bed, hung with purple, fragrant flowers all around their perfume shed. It was wrought in peace and quiet, who will touch it, none so bold, for its manifold adornments are a thousand shields of gold. They are running in thy footsteps on the road which thou didst tread, in the odor of the ointment that was poured upon thy head. The burning fire now has touched them, and the inner furnace glows, and the strengthening wine is tasted while the heavenly balsam flows. My beloved gently led me by the hand, O love divine, placed me in the inner cellar where I drank the wondrous wine. Coming forth I wandered lonely o'er the plain and knew no more, having lost the flock I followed in the days that went before. He embraced me there and taught me, sitting humbly at his feet, wondrous secrets of his wisdom, and the learning is so sweet. There I also made a promise I would be his faithful bride, true and constant, by that promise I will steadfastly abide. My beloved is my bridegroom, and my lord, oh, what a joy! I will henceforth all the powers of my soul for him employ. And the flock that once I tended, now I tend not as before, for my only occupation is to love him more and more. I have gone away for ever from the haunts of idle men, and a sharer in their follies I will never be again. They may say, and say it loudly, I am lost, but I am not. I was found by my beloved. Oh, how blessed is my lot! We will go in early morning, while the dew is on the ground, to the garden where the flowers in their beauty may be found, and will make a garland of them in which emeralds shall shine, knit and bound and held together by a single hair of mine. By that single hair that fluttered on my neck and seen by thee, thou didst look again upon it, and wert by it drawn to me. Thou wert made a willing captive, weak and slender though it be, and I dared to look upon thee, and in looking wounded thee. While on me thine eyes were resting, full of sweet and gracious love, they impressed on me their beauty, heavenly beauty from above. Then thy love flowed in upon me, and mine eyes obtained the grace that they saw in thee to worship. Oh, the beauty of thy face! I was once unclean and swarthy, in a miserable plight, yet I pray thee not to spurn me or to cast me from thy sight. Of my former degradation there remaineth not a trace, for thine eyes have rested on me, shedding comeliness and grace. THE BRIDEGROOM The little dove, white and stainless, wings her way returning now, to the ark of safety, bearing in her mouth the olive bough. Now her melancholy cooings will the turtle dove abate, on the verdant banks rejoicing, in the presence of her mate. Now the little dove was living in her solitude at rest, for in solitude, contented, she had built herself her nest. The beloved had been leading into solitude the dove, and in solitude was wounded with the arrows of her love. THE BRIDE In our common love rejoicing, my beloved, let us go to the summit of the mountain whence the limpid waters flow, to the hill of contemplation, there each other to behold. In thy beauty let us enter into mysteries untold. We will go at once together, my beloved and his bride, to the dark and secret caverns of the rock and there to hide. Into those mysterious caverns where no earthly light can shine, we will enter there in secret, we will taste 
the heavenly wine. For within those secret caverns thou thyself wilt show to me that which I am always longing in my inmost heart to see. In the innermost recesses of the caverns thou wilt give what the other day thou gavest, O my life, in thee I live. I shall breathe the air that quickeneth, and the nightingale shall sing. In my raptured ear the music of her voice shall sweetly ring. Pleasant grove in all its beauty, with the marvels it contains in the night, with the fire burning that consumes and never pains. I went in with my beloved, seen by no created eye, nor with all his strength and cunning durst Aminadabad come nigh. Then the siege was intermitted, then abandoned by the foe, and the cavalry dismounted when it saw the waters flow. End of section 2section three of poetry of st john of the cross this librivox recording is in the public domain section three the living flame of love o living flame of love how painless is the smart thy tender wounds create within my very heart o end at last the weary strife and break the web of this my life O gentle hand in touch, O wound in sweetness rife, O burning, a foretaste of everlasting life. The debt is paid that long was due, And death by death brings life anew. O lamps of fire that burn, illumining the night, Sense in its caverns glows with unaccustomed light. They once were dark, but now are bright, And to my love give warmth and light. How loving thou dost lie, Awake within my breast, And by thyself alone, In secret there at rest, The sweetness of thy blissful breath Makes strong my love, And strong as death. End section 3 Section 4 Of Poetry of St. John of the Cross this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 4 A Soul Longing for the Vision of God I live, and yet not I, in a manner hoping that I am dying because I am not dead. I am not now living in myself, and without God I cannot live, for without Him I am also without myself. This life of mine, what is it? A thousand deaths to me, For I am waiting for my very life, Dying, because I am not dead. This life that I am living Is a lifeless life, And so a death continuing, Until I come to live with thee. God, hear thou my cry, This life of mine I will it not, I die, because I am not dead. When I am away from thee, what is my life to me? The agony of death. None greater have I ever seen, O wretched that I am! For while I am living on, I die, because I am not dead. The fish that from the water leapeth is not without relief. The death that it endures does end in death at last. What death can ever equal my misery of life? For I, the more I live, the more I die. When I see thee in the sacrament and begin to be relieved, the absence of fruition creates a deeper pang. All brings greater pain, and the pain is so bitter that I am dying because I am not dead. And if, O oh Lord, I have a joy in the hope of seeing Thee, my sorrow is increased, because I fear to lose Thee. Living in dread so great, and hoping as I hope, I die, because I am not dead. From this death deliver me, O oh God, and give me life, nor let these fetters hold me, 
they are so strong. Behold, I die to see thee, and in a manner hoping that I am dying because I am not dead. My death I will bewail then, and lament my life, by reason of my sins still here prolonged. O oh my God, when shall I be there, where I may truly say, I live at last, because I am not dead. End of section 4section five of poetry of st john of the cross this librivox recording is in the public domain section five ecstasy of contemplation i entered but i knew not where and there i stood not knowing all science transcending i knew not where i entered for when I stood within, not knowing where I was, I heard great things. What I heard, I will not tell. I was there as one who knew not, all science transcending. Of peace and devotion, the knowledge was perfect, in solitude profound. The right way was clear, but so secret was it that I stood babbling, all science transcending. I stood enraptured, in ecstasy, beside myself, and in my every sense, no sense remained. My spirit was endowed with understanding, understanding naught, all science transcending. The higher I ascended, the less I understood. It is the dark cloud illumining the night, therefore he who understands knows nothing ever. All science transcending. He who really ascends so high annihilates himself, and all his previous knowledge seems ever less and less. His knowledge so increases that he knoweth nothing. All science transcending. This knowing that knows nothing is so potent in its might that the prudent in their reasoning can never defeat it. For their wisdom never reaches to the understanding that understandeth nothing, all science transcending. This sovereign wisdom is of an excellence so high that no faculty nor science can ever unto it attain. He who shall overcome himself by the knowledge which knows nothing, will always rise, all science transcending. And if you would listen, this sovereign wisdom doth consist in a sense profound of the essence of God. It is an act of His compassion to leave us not understanding, all science transcending. the same subject. In an act of daring love, and not of hope abandoned, I mounted higher and higher, so that I came in sight of the prey. That I might come in sight of that prey divine, I was forced to fly so high as to be lost to sight. Yet in that act supreme I grew weaker in my flight, but my love was still so strong that I came in sight of the prey. When I ascended higher, my sight grew faint and dim, and my greatest conquest was in the darkness made. But as my love was strong, blindly forth I leapt. I mounted higher and higher, so that I came in sight of the prey. In a way most strange, I made a thousand flights in one, for the hope that is from heaven, what it hopes, attains. This was my only hope, and my hope was not in vain, for I mounted higher and higher, so that I came in sight of the prey. But the nearer I drew in this act sublime, 
the more lowly, base, and vile, and humiliated I grew. I said, none can reach it, and abasing myself more and more, I mounted higher and higher, so that I came in sight of the prey. End of section 5section six of poetry of st john of the cross this librivox recording is in the public domain section six god the supreme good without support and with support without light and in darkness living i see myself wasting away my soul is detached from everything created, and raised above itself into a life delicious, of God alone supported, and therefore I will say that what I most esteem is that my soul is now without support and with support. And though I am in darkness in this mortal life, my misery is not so great. For if I have not light, I have the life celestial, for the love of that life, in the excess of its blindness, keeps the soul submissive, without light and in darkness living. Love is doing this. I have known it since, for be it ill or well with me, it makes all one joy. It transforms my soul. And so in its sweet flame, which in myself I feel, I see myself rapidly burning and wasting away. The Same Subject For all the beauty of the world, never will I lose myself, but only for that I know not, which happily is found. Sweetness of good that is finite, the utmost it can do is to pall upon the appetite and vitiate the taste. For all the sweetness in the world, never will I lose myself, but only for that I know not, which happily is found. The generous heart will never rest where it can be at ease, but only where it meets with difficulties, naught can ever satisfy it. And its faith ascends so high as to taste of that I know not, which happily is found. He that is on fire with love, divinely touched of God, receives a taste so new that all his own is gone, like one who of a fever ill loathes the food before him and longs for that I know not, which happily is found. Be not at this astonished that the taste should thus be changed, for the cause of this affection from all others differs. And so everything created is an alien to it, and it tastes that I know not, which happily is found. For when once the will has been touched of God, it never can be satisfied except in God alone. But because his beauty is such that faith alone can see it, it tastes it in I know not what, which happily is found. And now, of him enamored, tell me if you are in pain, for there is no sweetness in anything created. Alone, without force and figure, without support or rest, tasting there I know not what, which happily is found. Do not think the inner heart, which is of priceless worth, rejoices or is glad, and that which here sweetness gives. But rather above all beauty raised, that is, can be, or has ever been, taste there, I know not what, which happily is found. He who seeks a greater gain will rather turn his thoughts to that he has not acquired than to that he has already. And therefore, for a greater venture, I shall always be inclined neglecting all for that I know not, which happily is found. 
for all that in the way of sense I may obtain on earth, and all I may understand, however high it may be, for all grace and beauty, never will I lose myself, but only for that I know not, which happily is found. End of section 6section 7 of poetry of st john of the cross this librivox recording is in the public domain section 7 song of the soul rejoicing in the knowledge of god by faith i know the fountain well which flows and runs though it be night that everlasting fountain is a fountain hid and where it is I know well, though it be night. Its source I know not, because it has none, but I know that therein all things begin, though it be night. I know that nothing can be in beauty like it, and that of it heaven and earth do drink, though it be night. I know well it is of depths unfathomable, and that none can ever sound it, though it be night. Its brightness is never dimmed, and I know that from it all light proceeds, though it be night. I know its streams are so abundant, its waters hell and heaven and earth, though it be night. The torrent that from this fountain rises, I know well, is so grand and so strong, though it be night. This everlasting fountain lies concealed in the living bread to give us life, though it be night. It calls on every creature to be filled with its waters, but in the dark, though it be night. This living fountain, for which I long, I see in this bread of life. I see it now, though it be night. End of section 7 Section 8 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8 Song of Christ and the Soul A shepherd is alone and in pain, deprived of all pleasure and joy. His thoughts on his shepherdess intent, and his heart is by love most cruelly torn. He weeps, not because he is wounded with love, and his distress brings him no pain, though a wound is made in his heart, but he weeps because he thinks he is forgot. His beautiful shepherdess, so does he think, has forgotten him. That thought alone makes him suffer in the land of the stranger, and his heart is by love most cruelly torn. The shepherd exclaims, Ah, wretch that I am, for I am abandoned and left. My presence is shunned by my love, and my heart for her love is most cruelly torn. At last he was raised on a tree, where he opened his beautiful arms, and on it, he died, his heart by love, most cruelly torn. End section 8 Section 9 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9 The Most Holy Trinity and the Communication of the Three Persons The Most Holy Trinity In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, in whom he possessed bliss everlasting. The Word was God. He is the beginning. He was in the beginning and never began. He was the beginning itself, and therefore had none. The Word is the Son, from the beginning born, He has begotten forever, and is forever begetting. 
he gives him of his substance for ever, and has it for ever himself. And thus the glory of the Son is that he hath in the Father, and all his glory the Father hath in the Son. As the lover with his love, each in the other living, so this love which both unites is one in both. In dignity and might, co-equal with them both, three persons and one love, the three are one. And in the three one love, one lover makes of all. The lover is the love in whom each doth live. The being which the three possess, each by himself possesses, and of the three each loves the other, in that he hath this being. This being is each one, and alone makes them one, in a way ineffable, beyond the reach of words. And so that love which makes them one is infinite itself, for one love makes the one the three, and is their being as well. And that love, the more it makes them one, the more it is their love. THE COMMUNICATION OF THE THREE PERSONS In the love of both proceeding, it hath limits none. Words of gladness spoke the Father to his only Son. Words they were of joy profoundest, understood of none, but of him exulting in them, whose they were the Son. Of these words of gladness, only this was heard by me. Not my son can give me pleasure when I have not thee. But if aught should give me pleasure that I seek in thee, he who gives to thee most pleasure gives it most to me. He who thee in naught resembleth cannot be like me. Life of life, my whole rejoicing, is alone in thee. Thou art my eternal wisdom, Thou, light of my light. In Thee, figure of my substance, Is my whole delight. Thee, my son, he who loveth, Shall have love of me, And the love wherewith I love him Is my love of Thee. So great then is my love of Thee, That he who loveth Thee Shall be also loved by me. End of section 9Section 10 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 10 The Creation O my son, I long to give thee, in my love, a loving bride, who shall by thy goodness merit with us ever to abide who shall at the heavenly banquet eating of my bread with me learn to know the wondrous treasure that i have my son in thee and that in thy grace and beauty as a glory round her shed she with me may joy for ever then the son gave thanks and said on the bride which thou wilt give me i my brightness will bestow so that she my father's goodness in its light may love and know, learning also how my being from his being doth overflow. With my arms I will embrace her, and thy love shall be her light, so forever shall thy goodness be exalted with delight. The Same Subject for the merits of thy love, then, be it done, the Father said. In the word the Father uttered, all created things were made. In the everlasting wisdom rose the palace of the bride, which, two substances created, in a twofold form divide. With varieties unnumbered was the lower part arrayed, while the higher glowed in beauty with the wondrous gems displayed that the bride might know the bridegroom who her heavenly nuptials graced. The angelic hosts in order in the higher part were placed. Man was placed, his nature lower, in the lower part on earth. 
being fashioned of a substance which was of inferior worth. And although both place and nature God in this way did divide, yet the two are both together, but one body of the bride. And the two, although divided, are one bride in his one love, who in gladness as the bridegroom is possessed by those above. Those below in hope are living of the faith that he has given, for one day he will exalt them, he hath said so unto heaven. For of those of base condition he will take away the shame, and exalt them, so that nothing shall remain to them of blame. He in all things with their likeness will himself one day invest, he will come and dwell among them as his own elected rest. God himself will be incarnate, God will have a human birth, eating he will come, and drinking, and converse with men on earth. He will dwell himself among them, and continually stay, till the final consummation, when the ages melt away. Then shall both rejoice together in the endless life of bliss, for to him belongs the headship of the bride, and she is his. He shall bring the just together, naught shall them from her divide, for they are the living members of the body of the bride. He will tenderly embrace her, he will give her of his love, and, united with him, take her to his Father's home above. Into joy shall she then enter, God no greater joy can give, when absorbed in him for ever, she the life of God shall live. So the Father, Son, and Spirit, three in one and one in three, live each living in the other, the most blessed Trinity. End of section 10. Section 11 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 11. The Desires of the Holy Fathers. When the ancient saints were waiting, hope came down to their relief, and made lighter by its presence the sore pressure of their grief. But still hope deferred together with the longing which they had to behold the blessed bridegroom, made them sick at heart and sad. Pouring forth their supplications, in their misery they lay, sighing, weeping, and lamenting, with strong crying night and day. That he would the times determine, and among them come and stay, oh, that I, so one entreated, might rejoice to see his day. Hasten then thy work and finish, send him, Lord, whom thou wilt send, was the cry of one another's, O oh, that he the heavens would rend. That I might behold his coming, and my wail be turned to mirth, let the clouds rain down the just one, so long desired on the earth. Let the earth which brought forth briars now break forth, and in their room let it bear the sacred flower which shall ever on it bloom. Others also, oh, how blessed shall that generation be, which shall merit in time coming God's most holy face to see. Men shall throng around and touch him, they shall in his sight remain, in the sacraments rejoicing, he himself shall then ordain. The Same Subject These and other supplications, as the centuries rolled by, men poured forth with greater fervor as the promised time drew nigh. Aged Simeon in the furnace of his longing burning lay, praying God that he would grant him of his grace to see that day. And the ever-blessed Spirit condescended to his cry, and consoled him with the promise that the old man should not die till he saw the ever-living God descending from above, took him in his arms and held him, and embraced him in his love. End section 11 
Section 12 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 12 The Incarnation and the Nativity The Incarnation In the fullness of the ages Now had come the holy tide For the payment of the ransom Of the long expectant bride groaning in the house of bondage underneath the legal yoke of the precepts given by moses when these words the father spoke i my son have in thy likeness and thy image made thy bride and in that resemblance worthy to be ever at thy side but in one respect unlike thee for her nature is not thine she is flesh her nature human while thy nature is divine Perfect love demands a likeness, in the lovers it unites. For the most complete resemblance, most aboundeth in delights. Now the love and exultation of the bride would greatly grow, If she saw thee in her likeness, in the flesh, on earth below. Then the Son the Father answered, Lo, my will is ever thine and my glory which i cherish is that thine is also mine i am ready at thy bidding for thy will is my delight to make known at once thy goodness and thy wisdom and thy might i will manifest thy justice and proclaim throughout the earth thy supremacy and beauty and the sweetness of thy worth i will go and seek my bride then and upon myself will take all the poverty and sorrows she now suffers for my sake. And that I, true love may give her, I will give for her my own. So shall I present her, rescued, from the pit before thy throne. The Same Subject God then summoned the archangel, holy Gabriel, him he sent, to the blessed Virgin Mary, to obtain the maid's consent. She consented. In that instant the mysterious work was done, and the Trinity a body, wrought and fashioned for the Son. In this wondrous operation, though the sacred three concurred, he who in the womb of Mary was incarnate is the Word. He who had a father only had a mother also then, and it was in other fashion than the manner is of men. In the womb of holy Mary, he his flesh did then receive. So the Son of God most highest, we the Son of Man believe. THE NATIVITY Now at last the destined ages their appointed course had run, when rejoicing from his chamber issued forth the bridegroom's son. He embraced his bride, and held her lovingly upon his breast, and the gracious mother laid him in the manger down to rest. There he lay, the dumb beasts by him, they were fitly stabled there, while the shepherds and the angels filled with melody the air. So the feast of their espousals with solemnity was kept, but Almighty God, an infant, in the manger moaned and wept. So the bride at her betrothal did the bridal gifts arrange, but the mother looked in wonder at the marvelous exchange. Man gave forth a song of gladness, God himself a plaintive moan, both possessing that which never had been hitherto their own. End of section 12《ซ็กชันเธอร์ทีนอัลปาวทรีอัลเซนต์จอห์นอัลเดอะครอสส์ทิสลิบริวอคส์รีคอร์ดิ้งอินในที่ปกติของเมืองซ็กชันเธอร์ทีนซูเปอร์ฟลูมินาบาบิโลนัสซัลม136ในทะเลของเรือที่ใกล้เคียงกับบาบิโลนเธอถูกพาไปในทะเลที่ใกล้เคียงกับบาบิโลนเธอถูกพาไปในทะเลที่ใกล้เคียงกับบาบิโลน I remembered thee, O Sion, with thy love my heart was sore. Sweet to me was thy memorial, so I wept, 
still more and more. Of my festal robes divested, those of woe around me flung, while my silent harp suspended from the willow branches hung. There I left it, fondly trusting, for my hopes in thee still lay, love my heart had deeply wounded, and had carried it away. So, I said, my wound is grievous, O oh, let love me wholly slay, into its fires then I threw me, that I might be burned away. Now the silly moth I blame not, that in the fire seeks its death, for I, while in myself but dying, draw in thee alone my breath. I for thee to death submitted, and for thee to life returned, for in thy most sweet memorial life and death were both inurned. In their merriment exulting, heedless of their captives' wrongs, strangers bade me rise and sing them Sion's old familiar songs. Sing us of the songs of Sion, we would hear them, strange demand. How can I, lamenting Sion, sing them in a foreign land? In the chants once so familiar, how can I uplift my voice? May they never be remembered, if in exile I rejoice. Let my tongue from speech refraining, to my palate silent cleave, if I, in the land of exile, where I dwell alone and grieve, even amidst the verdant bowers of the Babylonic land, should forget thee, let my right hand cease its cunning to command. If I make not thee, O Sion, the beginning of my mirth, or if I rejoice in keeping any festival of earth, thou, of Babylon the daughter, shalt lie prostrate in the dust, lost and wretched, but for ever, blessed is he in whom I trust. In the day of retribution, he will thee at last afflict. He will lay on thee the burden thou didst once on me inflict. He will me, thy weeping captive, with thy little children take, and to Christ the rock shall bring them. I have left thee for his sake. End of section 13Section 14 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 14. Three Songs. The Soul's Craving, The Exiled Soul, and Desolation. First Song. The Soul's Craving. If in my lowly state the flames of love had power to swallow death, and should they so increase as to scorch up the waters of the sea, and hence, ascending, should set afire the triple elements, and in its flames consuming them, should make of them its fuel, if all these flames were love, I do not think that I, who feel such living thirst for love, could love as I desire. Nor could the flames I number but for a moment quench my longing, for they, compared with that eternal and transcendent fire, are of no more import than is an atom to the whole world's bulk, or than a drop of water to the ocean. My heart of miry clay hath neither heat nor more stability than hath the flowering grass, which in the hour it blooms is battered by the winds and droops decayed. For never could its fiery blaze ignite my heart as it desires, that it might reach the heights of that eternal Father of all lights. O wretched fate, which gives to love wings so inadequate! Not only do they fail to compass flight that is so sublime as doth that love supreme deserve they should do, but I perceive, alas, the powers of my love are so curtailed that in its feebleness, with wings close-clipped, I hardly reach to see God in the distance. Yet if from my base sort these flames of love could raise me, until I reached to gaze on Him, and brought me to His presence, so that my God should look upon them, oh, by His fire eternal, 
would they be caught with force unspeakable at once absorbed absorbed and swallowed up and into everlasting flame converted wherein my flames being drawn into his flames converted consuming in his love mine own flames burnt would become one with his most ardent love thus would be realized at length the deepest yearning of my breast seeing himself at length made one with him with closest tie and wholly satisfied second song the exiled soul my god my lord do thou remember that i by faith have gazed upon thy face lacking which sight no bliss exists for me for since i saw thee live i in such sort that there is naught can bring joy to my soul but for an hour or moment god of my life nothing can make me glad for all my gladness springs from sight of thee and faileth me because i have thee not if tis thy will my god i live forlorn i'll take my longing even from my comfort while dwelling in this world with me no happiness in aught shall bide except the hope of seeing thee my god where i shall ever dread to lose thee more when shall there dawn that most delicious day when o oh my glory i may joy in thee delivered from this body's heavy load there will my bliss be measureless entire at witnessing how glorious thou art wherein will lie the rapture of my life what will it be when i shall dwell with thee since suffering doth bring such happiness upraise me now o lord into thy heaven yet if my life can bring increase of glory to thine eternal being in truth i do not wish that it should end the unending moment of the bliss of heaven will end my pain and anguish so that i shall remember them no more i went astray because i served thee not as i have gained by knowing thee my god henceforth i crave to love thee evermore third song desolation tell me heaven tell me earth and ocean say ye mountains valleys little hillocks tell me vineyards olive trees and wheat fields tell me o ye plants and flowers and meadows answer where is he who gave to you your beauty and your being angels ye who joy to look upon him blessed souls who love him and possess him brides who are desirous of the bridegroom striving to obtain his sweet caresses tell me where is he who gave to you your beauty and your being ah no answer cometh all is silence lord when thou speakest not all else is mute my soul doth vainly seek for thee within it my heart is empty end of all bereft ah woe is me if war should wage within me whom should i find to guard me whom to shield joy of my soul and glory of my spirit if thou wert absent should i victor be tell me where thou dost wander o my bridegroom leaving in solitude the heart that loves thee where are thy shining rays o sun resplendent why hidest thou thy beams with anxious care thou followest the sinner why give no answer to the one who loves thee why dost thou hide thy face thou friend most cherished holding me for thine enemy wherefore didst thou depart in silence leaving me with no farewell be moved thou gentle love by the sad sighs of anguish which break forth for thy return return to me or bid me follow thee or bid me die but force me not to live while lacking life forsooth i will not till i see thee come if thou dost dwell in skied let me have wings that i may fly to thee if in pure souls thou find at thy resting place why dost not purify this poor polluted heart 
if thou dost make thy home within thy creatures, reveal in which of them thou dost repose. Where is thy habitation, tender lover? The world without thee holds no place for me. O ye birds, who warble forth sweet carols, serpents, animals, and scaly fish, tell me, and ye know, tell me, where is he who gave to you your beauty and your being? End of section 14section 15 of poetry of saint john of the cross this librivox recording is in the public domain section 15 the dark night and o oh, sweet dark night the dark night this cloud of darkness is light divine strong beautiful pure inaccessible delightful intimate being the sight of God, and Him alone, which to enjoy reaches the soul, with love all set afire, becoming blind, beholding naught, the essence is transcended and attained. When victory is won over the kingdom that was held by self, she setteth forth unseen by all, by all unnoticed, searching to find her God, by Him inflamed. In this departure, the soul goes out from self and takes her flight. Seeking her life, she rises to the imperial heaven, casting the veil from off her secret depths. Though sallying forth, incited by the mastery of her love, yet in herself she holds him, being engaged in joying o'er her good, to him united. She rests in peace. All images have disappeared. The intellect grown blind, the passions quelled, the powers perforce suspended. Her glory and her bliss were duly reached by stairs in safety scaled, divine the way, formed by Christ's mysteries. Now, having reached the longed-for end, resting in her beloved, she holds a ceaseless motion, being at peace and fully satisfied. That night serene, in which her life and depths enjoy her God, freed from all pain, she searches long and ardently within herself, and with desire goes forth to meet him. Love leads the way, throughout the dense dark cloud, and with no other teacher she safely journeys, to where God doth reveal to her his beauty, on her trackless path, bereft of intellect and memory. The King Divine doth manifest his might and glory, as far as may be in this mortal life. O crystal night! Led by thy lovely glamour, in union divine, the bridegroom and the bride are now but one. While the soul rejoices over the eternal word, a gentle wind, stirred by God's Holy Spirit, delights her very centre. Alone, they joy together, in a fair meadow by a wall enclosed, while fragrant odors scent the air serene, making it like no other earthly spot. The king, in whom she lives, in puissant power hath robbed her of herself, receiving her as inmate of his palace, holds her bereft entirely of herself. So great the strength, and force of him to whom she is united, so weak is she that yielding up herself to him she loses her own existence, being one with him. O oh, sweet dark night! O oh, sweet dark night, which brings no gloomy shades, but rather thine obscurity, the more it blinds, the more it delights the soul, and grows in beauty, as it grows more dense. Divine privations, blessed darkness, pleasant rest, and secret inspirations, happy the soul made blind by such refulgence, fortunate exchange. Denying self that it may not deny the one who ne'er denies, it enters the delicious gulf of that blind night, where they who enter find a vivid light. 
in the hidden depths of this resplendent darkness, illumined by the sun which dwelleth in her, night is made radiant day. O night of happiness which offers joy in such security to the enamoured soul, that she in slumber rests, and day seems night to her. To reach this rest she mounted by the secret hidden stairs, when in unconsciousness she on her summit slept, the rays of life fell on her. That ladder of repose, the beauteous mysteries of Christ, that lovely path, trod by his well-loved sons, wherein a thousand treasures are discovered. She soars aloft by flight, having two lovely wings, yet, once arrived, their delicate plumes are scorched. There she in peace enjoys the secret rays that stream from the Beloved, and all her house and its inhabitants are fallen asleep. Powerless and free from care, in drowsy rest, the dwellers in her mansions leave her free, the bridegroom opes and enters, yet when they are aroused, they murmur at their quick awakening. They enjoy his favors in solitude, beholding not the spouse, for still these dwellers are lost in slumber, nor do they make the slightest sound. Then the gentle bride, transformed and turned to her beloved, lives and reposes in him, and draws from him her life, since her own life has been consumed. While in this state has she repose, joy, life, and nourishment, but on returning to her former life she weeps because death lingers on its way. Yet, having wept, her graces still augmenting with her tears, her trials no longer grieve her, for on suffering she centers all her aims and all her love. Light in darkness and darkness which withdraws not in the light, distinctness in the mist. The mist is manifest in light in this abyss, and is not swallowed up. For shade is set or light divine by God's essence and presence. Thus, seen through clouds, by aid he gives in secret, the soul can, while on earth, enjoy his presence. End of section 15. Section 16 of Poetry of St. John of the Cross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 16. The Soul's Desire to Be with Christ and Ecstasy. The Soul's Desire to Be with Christ. I, for the living waters. My soul was seized with thirst insatiate, yearning to quit this body and its ills, and quaff of the eternal waters. Fain doth it desire to see itself delivered from these gyves, for life is tedious, dragged on in exile, from that dear fatherland of fond delight. Its present pains increase by numbering o'er the blessings it has lost, and the heart breaks, wounded by piercing pain, despoiled of the possession of its God. Happy that soul and blessed which dwelleth ever present in its God. Aye, blessed a thousandfold, for from a font it drinks, which to the end of time shall never fail. True fatherland, Thou solace of the souls that dwell in thee, assuaging to the full, the just no longer weep within thy borders, but adore their God. Our earthly life, compared with thee, O never-ending life, is so contemptible that we may truly say it is not life, but death most burdensome. O life curtailed and hard, when shall I see myself despoiled of thee? O narrow sepulchre, when will the bridegroom, for so long desired, upraise me from thee? O God, when shall I be wholly inflamed with thy most sacred love? Alas, when dawns the day that I may say farewell to things created, and be transported to thee in thy glory? When, love, O oh, when? When comes the time I shall enjoy such bliss? 
When comes that, when that I this dross forsake, and when such glorious victory? When shall I be united to thee, good Jesus, with a love so strong that no incitement of the world, the flesh, even death itself, nor eke the devil can suffice to break the unison? When, O oh my God, shall I be set on fire with thy sweet loves and kindling? When shall I enter in at last to joy, or when be offered wholly upon love's altar and consumed? Oh, that without delay this loving love might all to ashes burn! Ah, when shall I attain to that most blessed state, never for all eternity to change again? My God, my only good, my glory, and my comfort and my bliss, withdraw me from this mire, this wretched earth, to dwell in heaven with thee for evermore. Let me be one with thee, my God, not intervening, and withdraw thou what impedes. Thaw thou my coldness, which doth now obstruct thy love, curtailing its full measure. O oh, that thy love flamed with so fierce a glow as to consume my heart, that it dissolved or burnt me wholly, and struck from off my soul the body's yoke. Ope, Lord, the portal of thy love, to this poor wretch. Give certain hope of everlasting love to this weak, hapless worm of earth. Delay thou not to love, nor to bestow a puissant love for thee, nor tarry thou to turn thy eyes on me, O God omnipotent, who stand for ever present in thy sight. Thou biddest me call thee, and lo, I come with tears and cries to thee. Thou biddest me love, and that is my desire. But thou, my Lord, till when, O God, till when? Till when wilt thou delay to answer me? When give to me that love for which I crave? Return and gaze on me. Behold, I die. And yet it seems thou still dost fly from me. Ah, Lord eternal, my soul's delight, my glory, ah, sempiternal bounty, day serene, thou light, thou love, do not thy grace postpone. For thee I'll sigh, while I am captive in this prison held. Ne'er will I stay, recounting my petitions, until thou hast raised up and crowned me. If I forget thee, my God, my sweetest love, who wooest me, may I into oblivion dark sink down. Nor of entire creation let there be one who of me, sad soul, takes any thought. Ecstasy Wrapped in oblivion, the soul doth in a single moment learn more than the busy brain and sense, with all their toil, could ever learn. Mirrored within its God, it views to-day, to-morrow, and the past, and faith sees here, in time, the things that through eternity shall last. End of section 16 End of Poetry of St. John of the Cross